Hello everyone, it's Jack Cotton, luxury real estate expert, author, and agent. And here we are at part two of Common Negotiation Tactics. And once again, just to remind you, these aren't ones that I'm suggesting that you necessarily use, but they're ones that maybe it's time to time used against you. There are one or two in our group today that I do use, and I'll be sure to point those out. But number five is the red herring. This is when somebody makes a really low offer, <clears throat> and then they'll stick something in the offer to distract you from the really low price. Like, um, I don't know, we want all the artwork included, which is worth more than the house, or you know, we want a, a two-year closing, or we want a two-week closing, or we want all the furniture included, or we want to make sure, we want to do, a, um, an in, we had one where we want to do an intensive underground study to make sure there are no abandoned underground fuel tanks, either gasoline or fuel oil. It's, a, it's like a big red flag that <clears throat> is designed to distract you from the low price in their offer. So watch out for the red herring and understand it for what it is and just get rid of it. Number six is one I actually do use myself. It's called the trial balloon. In fact, politicians use the trial balloon all the time. In fact, they don't call it a trial balloon. They call it a leak. So whenever you hear something that was leaked to the press about something occurring in Washington, D.C., it's not really a leak, it's called a trial balloon because if people really react negatively to it, they say, oh, that was a leak and it wasn't really true. But if people love it, they can say, yeah, we were working on that. So the way we do it in real estate is, for example, a seller might say to me, you know, if I could get these people to 750,000, even though I'm asking 900, I would probably do the deal. So I might go to the other side and say, you know, if I could get my seller to 750, would that be something that would interest you? I don't tell them the seller's already agreed to it. I do a trial balloon because if they say, no way I'm going that high, then I haven't tipped my seller's hand and um, weakened their position for future transactions should one come up with this, with this one doesn't work. So the trial balloon is certainly ethical and is one that I use uh, pretty commonly. Number seven, I can't stand, is the lowball. This year, I've had more lowball offers than I've ever had. We had one offer, can you believe this? It was like, Less than 50% of the list price. Who in their right mind does that? But people do because it reframes, well, the idea is it totally reframes the person's thinking where I'm thinking about a million, now I'm thinking about $500,000 and you know, 700 would sound better. Whereas if they had just offered 700, maybe it wouldn't go together. They just want to, re they want to reframe and reset the whole stage. So my advice to you on lowballing is to be appreciative of the offer. Thank them for their interest. We're so glad you love the property enough to want to make an offer on the property, but that's way too low. But in the interest of making things, um, keeping things moving forward, my seller did make a token counter offer to you just to let them know they want to negotiate, but they're only going to come down 10 grand. Anyway, number seven is the low ball. This one, I can't stand, bait and switch. And um, we didn't see it all that often in real estate, but now we're seeing it with the advent of TRID, the new uh, disclosure rules that pertain to mortgages and all that stuff makes um, a cash deal a lot more beneficial. So we just had one this summer. We just had one close recently where the buyer came along and said, this is a cash offer. We'll, we'll buy your house for this much money and we'll pay cash. And um, that's great. The seller accepted the offer. Then the next thing we know, we have a call from an appraiser who's appraising the house for the bank. And then um, we have the closing, or trying to have the closing, and the bank paperwork wasn't done, so the closing got delayed for several hours. That, to me, is bait and switch. If you're going to make an offer, um, like a cash-like offer, the ethical way to do it is to say, listen, I'm going to make an offer. I am getting a mortgage, but I'm not making my offer contingent on getting a mortgage because I know I'll get approved. So that is the more above-board way to do it, not to say it's a cash offer and then go get a mortgage this, in this day and age with TRID. It's a nightmare. Don't do it. Number nine, I've had this used on me. This is very effective on me. I don't do well with um, are you nuts? But um, some people just go nuts. They yell, they scream, they go into tirades either in person or on the phone. Actually, um, going nuts is a lot easier to do on the phone than doing it in person. But um, I'm holding it out to here when you're yelling and screaming, just totally going crazy. And that really does work. I mean, I try to just you know, take a deep breath and let them vent and, and I'll do the silent treatment, which makes them go even more nuts until they just let them just run out of energy. So the silence uh, tactic we talked about last time is a great response to negotiation tactic number nine, which is, are you nuts? 
Number 10 is the written word, and it's sort of like the limited authority tactic where you pre-print things into your contract, but the way it can be used as a tactic that you need to be wary of is when certain agents or companies in your marketplace place might have their own forms. They're not using standard realtor board forms. They're using their own company forms. You really need to read the boilerplate very carefully. There's a lot of stuff hidden in there. So because it's pre-printed, people tend to think, oh, that's just a form. Everything's going to be okay in here. But if it's not from your local real estate board, it's pre-printed from some other source, read it very carefully because that's a great tactic to bury stuff in boilerplate and uh, you want to make sure you're not um, taken advantage of from that. So um, again, concentrate on the merits of the negotiation um, rather than the positions. Don't resist force with more force because you're just going to butt heads and people are going to dig in and then you get into positional bargaining and then nothing happens. You never get a win-win from that. So look for the principles that are underlying people's positions. Why, you know, why are they doing what they're doing? What is it they really want to attain? What is their goal? What is their motivation? Really understand that and look for solutions rather than getting hung up on the tactics. So recognize the tactic when it's used against you and question the tactic, not their personal integrity. For example, is that the silent treatment you're using on me? Rather than, hey, sleazeball, don't use a silent treatment on me. Just talk about the tactic, not the person. As a last resort, what's your backup plan? BATNA, B-A-T-N-A stands for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. Read the book Getting to Yes, you can learn all about BATNA. But as a last resort, be willing to walk away is all that means. Be willing to walk away and you'll be amazed at how many transactions will come together. So recognize them, don't use the dirty ones, and don't be intimidated. And uh, don't forget also to come to Luxury Real Estate Unplugged. Go to that website right now and check it out. It's really a great value in group coaching for Luxury Real Estate. We meet the first Tuesday of every month. Until next time, make it a great week.